thank you so much, guys, for the warm welcome. I would like to begin with a question, so if you don't mind, by a show of hands, how many of you consider yourselves to be a top performer in your respective field? That's pessimistic. And uh, how many of you would say I'm a somewhat average performer? That's better. And is there a brave soul in this room who would say I perform even below average? Yeah. Today I want to focus your attention to a three-letter word. A word that we all possess. A word that has influenced your answers just now. And that word is ego. But how do we define it exactly? If you ask psychologists in the room, they might want to refer to Sigmund Freud and his book, The Ego and Eat, written a hundred years ago. In it, Freud describes the ego as the balancer between our primitive needs and wants and our moral constraints. But if you ask Ryan Holiday, a more modern author on the topic, he might want to tell you that the ego is your enemy, an unrealistic voice that diminishes every true achievement you have made and can also badly affect your learning behavior. If you check it in the Latin dictionary, you will see the definition of I, myself. But if you ask six taxi drivers in Blagojevgrad, Bulgaria, at midnight, chances are at least three of them will tell you the guys in our government, they have ego. And I think what they've meant touches really close to what we assume ego is when using the word in our everyday lives. We associate it with negativity. Someone who speaks profoundly of himself, but words don't necessarily match his actions. The minute you see such an individual, the second you know what a beast you're dealing with. But how good are you at determining your own ego? How good are you at realizing if your ego is an asset that you want to keep or a liability that you move, want to move away from? And most importantly, if it is a liability, can you turn it into an asset? I've been struggling to find these answers for the past couple of years now, but what triggered me was the fact that I actually broke a record. It all happened during my first year at university when I was taking a lecture on leadership. When the professor gave us a list of 20 questions, he said, try to answer as quick as you can, don't overthink it. And I was very happy to be the top of the class. What, what he didn't tell us was that the answers are actually going to apply later on to an ego meter. He told us if you have a score between 7 and 10 out of 20, you're okay, you're like most people. If you have a score between 10 and 14, then you might want to think about your ego. If you have more than that, then are a very, very special case. Guess what? My score was 16. And since then, I started thinking, where does exactly my ego apply and how does it influence my personal and professional life? I was in a dilemma because from one side, it was clear that I needed to work on it. But on the other side, I deeply knew that my ego has helped me achieve almost everything in life that I feel proud of so far. My ego was there when I entered the best university in Bulgaria. That's an achievement. My ego was there when I started my journey in sales and essentially had the opportunity to lead a, tem a team of 10 people. And my ego was also there during all of the 21 interviews I had over the past couple of years now, from which I was rejected only twice, despite being underqualified for more than just those two. And I think that regardless if you thought about it in the same way or not, Everybody has had this dilemma. To trust our ego or to leave it aside? To try to drag it down? To kill it, maybe? Because we can feel, and it is actually proven, that ego can contain some benefits. Benefits that we can all enjoy and apply in our lives if we just learn how to manage it. So what are they? First, self-confidence. Now, the terms self-confidence and ego are often used interchangeably in our lives. And it's probably because on the surface they might look the same. They both resemble a belief. But, in fact, they have a significant difference. When our belief is derived from our self-confidence, 
we have a track record in our head. We believe in the practice, in the experience, in our abilities. But when the ego is derived, uh, when the belief is derived from our ego, we believe in our name, in the whole individual that we think we are. But nevertheless, I learned that the ego can set the foundations for your self-confidence. And to help you imagine that, I want you to think about a frightening challenge that you're about to face. Something that you know it's coming for you, you just want to hide and wait until it passes away. Something that absolutely butchers your self-confidence. Like maybe you're about to give a TED talk and having no idea what you should be talking about. Just maybe. Now, one of the proven ways to back yourself up with self-confidence is to do the reverse psychology. To try and think how you are at the top of this challenge. How you celebrate your rewards with your peers. By doing so, you promote feelings of optimism and power. And I think people with high ego find it easier to picture all of that. Because psychologically, our ego is not really bothered with the obstacles along the way. And I think you will agree that this can help us to start a frightening challenge. The second positive I find in having an ego is assertiveness. Having the power to stand up for yourself. The same power that makes us easily say the word I. Some might argue that they are actually the same thing. And the way we assert ourselves is we try to find loopholes in the environment, loopholes in which we can feel with our value. And I think having an ego might help you find these loopholes because having a strong sense of self-esteem does exactly that. And I wasn't really surprised when I once read the Harvard Business Review saying that one of the two most desired qualities in a good salesman are exactly for him to be somehow ego-driven. The third is resilience. It's facing harsh moments without breaking into peace. It requires a strong sense of who you are and where you're going in order to be resilient. Please correct me if I'm wrong. And fourth is ambition. I like to think of ambition as the energy we are willing to burn in order to achieve a goal. And our ego plays a vital role for our ambition because we fuel ambition with motivators. And three of the most prominent motivators are exactly the desire for recognition, power and prestige. All three proven to be somehow derived from our ego. So here they are. Positives I find in having an ego. But the thing is, they can never really become part of our character if we don't learn how to manage it. Because ego has this function to grow larger and larger and larger until it reaches a point where they not only not help us, but they start ruining our lives. And I think to learn how to avoid this, we should learn first how to read the symptoms of an overinflated ego. And to tell you the first one, I would like to tell you a story about myself. I was 10 years old when I was hit by my first dream. It all happened during a football game between Manchester United and Liverpool, two of the biggest rivals in the English Premier League. And during that game, Dimitar Berbatov, the Bulgarian superstar, scored three goals to conclude a very competitive win. I remember I cried after the third one. But um, I was watching the game with my friends from high school, in a cafe, in front of a TV screen. And once the match ended, I remember them standing up, started cheering, hugging each other, singing songs, Berbatov. But I, I was deeply focused in the TV screen, if, even after that final whistle. I was still listening how the fans sing Berbatov, Berbatov. And I think it was that moment when, at the age of 10, I realized I want to become a professional soccer player. Very excited, I went back home to share the wonderful news with my parents. And I said, Mom, Dad, I'm going to play football from tomorrow on until I become a very professional soccer player, just like Berbatov. My father said, OK, uh, you, know <laughs> you know what you're doing. Whereas my mother looked rather concerned. She said, honey, why don't you focus on something that can involve your good mathematical skills instead? 
And I was wondering, why would she say such a ridiculous thing? Like my grades did not were average at best. But nevertheless, I started going to practices once a week, maybe twice a week if the weather was nice. But the coach was not giving me much play time. It was probably because I wasn't really built to be a footballer. What's so funny? I kept going though, kept pushing hard once a week, bought the same shoes as Berbatov, until finally, three years after that, the coach decided to give me a chance. The thing was, I wasn't really like Berbatov, a striker, I was more like goalkeeper, you know. But as growing up, I realized I never wanted to be a professional soccer player. The things I wanted was to have fans and appraisal. And football was just one of the first things I saw that can give me that. Or in other words, I was experiencing the first symptom of having an overinflated ego, which is creating a fake reality in your head. People who experience this symptom often find themselves daydreaming, imagining themselves in the greatness of the wonderful future. But the problem is, they believe in what they imagine, but they never do imagine the whole process of actually getting there. And I think that's responsible for a lot of drama in our lives. It puts us in an emotional framework that is not always relevant, and it affects our personality, but also what surrounds us, which leads to the second symptom. I want to share, which is mainly struggling to connect with people. I like to believe that relationships are built based on what you give back and receive with people. And the people who love or respect us the most are probably the people to which we found a way how we can contribute in their lives. We have probably filled in an emptiness. But the person with high ego doesn't really feel that emptiness, right? He assumes himself as a well-defined individual and can hardly someone make an uncomfortable change. If you ever been in a situation where you enter a room full of people and you thought to yourself, nobody here can teach me something valuable, then most probably you have experienced this symptom. The things we like to get from people instead are validation and respect. That's all about what about the ego cares, which leads me to the third symptom to think predominantly about outcomes. We keep our legal alive with validation. And what does the mind suggest to be the easiest and fastest way of getting it? By producing outcomes. We start thinking about the final results and we pay less attention to the journey that actually conveys most of the lessons. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you observe a task only by how hard or easy it is, then you most probably have experienced this symptom. And I find it a very useful skill to understand when does your ego go off the chart. But it's actually not enough. It needs a proper reaction. And lastly, I want to share with you the best advices I follow when sensing these symptoms within myself. And what a better way to start than making a person happy every day for two weeks in a row. I have read this tip first from a book written by Dale Carnegie. He used it in the context of how to cure a depression. But after practicing it, I realized it also strikes our egotistical selves. Because when you're trying to produce a smile, you're thinking, what would produce that smile? Or in other words, you're expressing empathy. The strongest cure against high ego. And I find it very effective because it can also lift ourselves up. Isn't a reason to be confident knowing that you can make someone happy? I think it is. The second tip I like to follow is to be a hyper-realist. Or in other words, to focus on what you do, not who you are. There will be times in our lives that will, over, that will naturally overinflate our ego. Marriage, promotion, great. 
election. But it is up to us until when we will be satisfied about it. Chances are if you keep it for too long, you might break your ego. But being a hyper-realist prevents you from falling into this because being a hyper-realist means seeing things as plain as they are, being in this present moment. And I want to give you an example. If your LinkedIn title suggests that you are a startup co-founder, but everything you do during a day is to try and persuade someone, make an article for you, for a hyper-realist, you're nothing more than being annoying. Third is to not wait for gratitude. When was the last time you helped someone and you didn't receive a thank you? Or you just received an automatic thank you? It can be discouraging, right? But badly, it activates our ego, just like that. But why should we care? Please remember that people, in the end of the day, are self-interested. We think first about ourselves and then about others. So why should we poison ourselves when someone didn't bother to thank us? And to finish, I would like to say that our ego is there for us and it will always be there. But as Freud has once said, the ego is not a master in its own house. We are. And imagine how your life would look like if you believe in yourself, but you remember to express humility. If your ambition leads you out of the comfort zone, but your empathy keeps you on the ground. If you assert yourself with resilience, but knowing the line of arrogance. I think we will see not a world of top, bad, or medium performers, but a world of winners. And that is an idea worth spreading. Thank you.